Hello, I'm Larissa Kaiser, and I am a co-chair of the PEN America Translation Committee. And just a note before we start that today's event is being recorded. But welcome to the opening event in a series of bilingual readings organized by the Translation Committee members and hosted by PEN America in honor of Women in Translation Month. I'd like to thank PEN for their support and also extend our gratitude to the four co-organizers of these events, Nancy Naomi Carlson, Jenna Tang, Sharon Dolan, and Piotr Flor Flor Florchik. And thanks, of course, to our, all of our readers and to you who are joining us today. Women in Translation Month was launched in 2014 by blogger Maytel Radzinski to address gender disparity in the field of translation. Women in Translation Month aims to highlight women and non-binary writers and translators whose recognition and representation in literary publishing is essential to freedom of expression. The last 18 months have been devastating around the world, from the COVID-19 pandemic to climate disasters to ongoing police violence. Forces of nationalism, greed, and bigotry are working to forge deeper divides and sow distrust among us. Reading translations in this context is a political act, and one that seeks to connect us across language barriers and urges us to consider per perspectives and contexts we might not otherwise have access to. And while many of us might long to return to in-person events, one positive consequence of the necessity of going virtual is that this platform allows us to involve and to reach people around the world. I'll now turn things over to our moderator, Piotr Florczyk. Piotr Florczyk has published 10 volumes of Polish poetry translations, including Julian Kornhauser's I'm Half of Your Heart, Selected Poems, and Anna Swer's Building the Barricade, which won the 2017 Fountain Translation Award and the 2017 Harold Morton Landed Translation Award. So over to you, Piotr. Thank you, Larissa, for that lovely introduction. And I echo all of her thanks. I'm so happy to be moderating this exciting and one of a kind event where we are presenting five translators and their authors in bilingual readings in Spanish, Japanese, Swedish, Hebrew, French, and of course, English. In terms of the format, each pair will have about 10 minutes to present their work. At the conclusion of the last reading, we'll have a short Q&A session if time permits. So please submit your questions for any of the panelists in the comment section and we'll ask as many as we have time for at the end. Okay, let's get started. Our first pair of readers will be translator Kelsey Veneda and author Natalia Litvinova. Kelsey Veneda's translations include Sergio Espinosa's Into Muteness, published by Valise Books in 2020, and Berta Garcia Faet's The Eligible Age, published by Songbird Bridge Press, excuse me, in 2018. And she's the author of the poetry chapbook Rare Earth, published by Finishing Line Press also last year. Kelsey Veneda is the program manager of the American Literary Translators Association in Tucson, Arizona. And Natalia Litvinova is an Argentine poet, translator, and co-editor of the press Editorial Lantan. She was born in Gomel, Belarus, and has lived in Buenos Aires since her family's immigration in 1996. Her books have been translated into multiple languages and published in Argentina and elsewhere. She teaches writing classes. Welcome, Kelsey and Natalia. Thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you to the organizers and to all of our fellow readers as well. Natalia and I are very honored to kick off um, today's reading and this series as well. We are going to share some of her poems and my translations from this book, which is Sesta de Trenzas, Basket of Grades. Um, and this book, um, in this book, Natalia draws on her family history and her rural Slavic ancestry, um, presenting ideas of memory, community, labor, loss, and the power of tradition and belief. Basket of Braids is also about the aftermath of World War II, which left Natalia's grandparents' community uh, devastated and impacted its psyche for generations to come. Natalia's work in this collection is significant to me for a few reasons. Um, it really turns on the strength of ties between women and the way in which the speakers, uh, women ancestors, pass down tradition and culture. Um, but it also speaks to the immigrant experience and to making a way for memory and culture as Natalia constructs her own multilingual, multicultural identity. 
Um, the poems are a wonderful challenge to translate because they're concise. So there's just a few words per line and a lot weighing on those choices in translation. Um, they're like little gems or sometimes little spells. Uh, and we've also found that we have much in common in our poems as I also write about uh, generational memory and generational trauma. So we will read alternating between Spanish and English and Natalia will begin. Buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Gracias Kelsey, gracias a los organizadores por permitirnos estar aquí. Saludo a todos los que nos están escuchando en este momento. Eh, voy a arrancar, tengo el mismo ejemplar que él sí acá, nos complementamos. Eh, voy a arrancar con el primer poema que dice así. Las mujeres de mi familia guardan el cabello que se cortan en un cesto de trenzas. Es una tradición antigua, ya no se sabe quién la inició. Mechones, bucles, pelo suelto, cobrizo, rubio, ceniza... Temo que los roben las urracas o que lleguen a manos de una bruja. Si viene, no le abras la puerta. Y si abres, no le dejes pasar. Y si la dejas, no le des ni sal ni pan. Todo lo que haya tocado lo convertirá en su elemento, advierte la abuela. The women in my family keep the hair they cut off in a basket of braids. It's an ancient tradition. No one can remember who started it. Locks, curls, loose hair, coppery, blonde, or ashen. I fear the magpies will steal the hair or a witch will come upon it. If she comes, do not open the door for her. And if you open it, do not let her in. And if you let her in, give her neither salt nor bread. She'll turn everything you've touched into her own element, grandmother warns. En la casa, los manteles y las cortinas picoteadas por la luz. Mi maldición estuvo aquí, polvo del campo en el piso y las amapolas cabizbajas. El caballo relincha parado sobre las patas traseras. Le pregunto a mamá, ¿por qué apagaron las velas y dieron vuelta los espejos? Responde que en la tradición eso se hace para no molestar a los muertos. In the house, the tablecloths and the curtains pecked by light. My curse was there, dust from the fields on the floor and the poppies downcast. The horse whinnies rearing on his hind legs. I ask mama why they blew out the candles and turned the mirrors around. She answers that according to tradition, we do this to keep from bothering the dead. El pueblo impone la boda de mi madre. Trenzan flores en su pelo, malva y llantén. La visten de tule de encaje. Ella mira por la ventana, inmóvil, como si posara para alguien. Ajustan las cintas, aprietan el corsé, la llevan descalza al campo llovido para que su vestido se impregne de agua. Los pétalos caen de su corona, barro y pasto entre los dedos de los pies. Caminamos, barriendo el suelo con ramos de lavanda, para que ningún animal siga sus huellas y el novio no la pueda encontrar. The village forces my mother to marry. They braid flowers into her hair, mallow and plantain, dress her in tulle and lace. She looks out the window frozen as if posing for someone. They adjust her ribbons, tighten her corset, bear her barefoot to the damp fields so the rainwater soaks her dress. The petals fall from her crown, 
mud and grass between her toes. We walk sweeping the ground with lavender sprigs so no animal follows her footsteps and her betrothed cannot find her. Soy la región que mi madre mejor conoce. Levanta mi brazo, huele mi axila, sabe que corrí bajo la lluvia y dónde me escondí, pero desconoce mis pesadillas. I am the region my mother knows best. She lifts my arm, smells my armpit, knows I ran through the rain and where I hid but she doesn't know my nightmares. No piensan en mi madre los potrillos, brincan erotizados sobre el pasto mojado, atraviesan el bosque con ella cuestas y lo desconocen cuando se pierde en la espesura, duermen parados mientras la esperan, una luz les brota del lagrimal, extraña y mínima, como los sueños de los humanos. The foals don't think about my mother. They jump erotically on the wet grass, cross the forest with her on their backs and forget her when she loses her way in the thicket. They sleep standing up, waiting for her. A light springs from their tear ducts, strange and faint, like the dreams of humans. Cuando no hay nadie, abro el arcón de mamá, saco su vestido, un ramo seco de lavanda y la trenza del caballo atada con una cinta. El encaje ya no rozará su piel. Sacrificó el caballo que la llevaba a ver a su amante. When no one is around, I open mama's chest, pull out her dress, a dry sprig of lavender, and the horsehair braid tied with a ribbon. The lace will never brush her skin again. She sacrificed the horse that carried her to see her lover. Algunas noches, ella saca su vestido con olor a fruto seco. La espío por la rendija. Nuestras vidas están llenas de distancias que los caballos no pueden acortar. No va a los domingos a lavar ropa al río, como las muchachas de la aldea. El agua no la toca, las rocas no le raspan la piel. No sabe lo que se dice por ahí. Lo que yo sé y guardo como una joya que no puedo usar. Some nights she pulls out the dress, smelling of dried fruit. I spy on her through a crack in the wall. Our lives are full of distances even horses can't shorten. She doesn't go on Sundays to wash clothes in the river like the village girls. The water doesn't touch her. The rocks don't scrape her skin. She doesn't know what they say around here, what I know and prize like a jewel I can't use. Los hongos crecen sobre el moho de los árboles. Arranco sus cabezas, mastico y escupo sin tragar. Tengo aliento a humedad, a subsuelo, a escondite. Aplasto los pétalos de las amapolas. Me pinto la cara con su jugo. Lavo el polvillo de las mariposas. Abro el caparazón de los escarabajos. La fuerza de lo débil me posee. Toadstools grow out of the lichen on the trees. I pull off their tops chew and spit without swallowing. My breath is humid, subsoil, hideaway. I smash the petals of the poppies, paint my face with their juice. I lick butterfly wing dust, 
open the carapaces of the beetles. The strength of the weak possesses me. Thank you so much, Kelsey and Natalia, for great reading. Thank you. Our next pair of readers will be translator Arthur Ray G. Morris and author Lee Kotomi, whose reading has been pre recorded and will be shared by Arthur in just a second. Arthur Ray G. Morris is a translator from Japanese. His translation of Solo Dance by Lee Kotomi is his first full length literary translation and will be published by World Editions in 2022. Congratulations, Arthur. Lee Kotomi is a bilingual Japanese Chinese writer, translator, and interpreter. She was born in Taiwan in 1989 and moved to Japan in 2013. In 2017, she won the 60th Gunzo New Writers Prize for Excellence for her first novel, Solo Dance, written in Japanese, her second language. Welcome, Arthur and Lee. Hey, thank you for, for the lovely introduction. Saves me time to having, <laughs> having to, inter, in to introduce myself. Um, yeah, so Lee can't be here today. So um, uh, she sent me a pre-recording of her. I think it's uh, almost half three in the morning in Japan. Um, so <laughs> she's probably asleep right now. <laughs> um, it's, um, we'll be reading an extract from Solo Dance about a third of the way through the book. Um, it's a novel about um, a young woman from Taiwan who comes to Japan um, trying to escape her past. Um, and it's kind of a coming of age story for um, a young uh, queer person in East Asia. Um, and I just wanted to give a short, um, it does deal with a few um, topics such as uh, sexual assault. So a small content warning in case anyone doesn't want to hear that. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, see if this works. Uh, is that sure? Is can you see a black screen with? Um, yes, Arthur. A, okay, yes. cool. Uh -huh. uh, I'll play it, and if no sound comes out, uh, please tell me. Yeah, no sound, Arthur. Uh, let's see how to... Share sound, okay. There you go. Yeah. Could you hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I'll start from the beginning. I look at your name. Carlos, you know, what did I put on a sick to say? Can you do? Can you do a gene seva? Not that you can see a television. So, in a day, then to a source of your day, curing you are a hammer of your kind, your show has a celebrity that she shall share to the country of Taiwan. せいの幸福を感じられていたが、あの夜を境に彼女はそこらしの深淵をいつまでも過ぎなくし続けることだった。深淵ではあれや言葉など、かつて美しく感じられた事物には手が届かず、ただいてついた無辺の闇だけが広
上下の揺れを激しく覚えたそして嗅覚消毒液とさまざまな薬品がごちゃ混ぜになっている同意独特の匂い視覚ようやく開いたまぶたに差し込んだのは病室の無機的な発光だったついで痛覚全身が痛かった特に両足の間は灼熱の撤回で焼かれているような痛みを感じた視覚両親とおぼしきぼんやりとしたシルエットが視界の端で揺れていたしばらくした後、医師とおぼしき人物に何かを聞かれ何かを答えたそして眼前が急に暗くなった夢のない深い眠りの淵だったその後にあの無機的な病室で肉くと覚醒と昏睡を繰り返したかはさなかではない記憶が完全な連続体となったのは実家に帰った後だった3階にある見慣れた部屋と見慣れた家具窓から外を消防すると見慣れた田んぼ一面の見慣れ式が目に入る全てが見慣れている風景のはずなのに何一つ現実感がわかずまるで病棒とした空気を隔てているように感じたこれは似ていても全く異なる世界彼女は分かったもう元の世界には戻れないのだと部屋のドアが開いて誰かが入ってきた彼女は反射的にドアの方に向いて身構えた母だったもちろん頭にはそれがはっきり分かっていたがなぜか遠くの世界の自分とは何の関係もない誰かのように感じられたもっと正確に言えば人の感じがしなかった人形やマネキンのような人の形をした何かのように感じられた起きたのねと母は彼女に話しかけた両手に何か麺類の入っている丼を持っていたそっかもう就職の時間か一言のように彼女はそう思った Cool uh, that was Lee Kutomi's reading of、um, the small sample that we'll be doing today Um, I'm not sure how much time I, I wasted with the technological、um, difficulty, but、uh, I'll keep reading until, until Piotr tells me, tells me to stop talking. On that dark night, due to the genitals and semen of a man whose face she couldn't remember, her life was split in two. Until that moment, thanks to writing, she had been able to overcome the feeling of loss that lurked in her heart. And thanks to Shalshe, she was able to even see some form of happiness. But ever since, she has been forced to remain in everlasting freefall into a bottomless darkness. Love, fiction, all those things she once viewed as beautiful were unreachable from this abyss. All that existed around her was a cold, unending dark. Not even Shalsha could save her from this pit. She didn't know whether that man was ever caught, nor did she care. After all, it wasn't as if his arrest would erase this disaster. Her memories were like a shredded roll of film scattered around her. First, there were the sounds, voices she recognized and those she did not fluttered into her ears. Why was she walking down that alleyway all alone at night? She's only 18, the poor thing. I ought to warn my own daughter to be careful too. Next was her sense of touch. She felt a horrible lurching feeling as if she were being carried. Then came smell. A concoction of alcoholic disinfectant and medicines, the smell of a hospital. After that, sight. The first thing that filtered into her eyes after she finally managed to open them was the clinical light of a hospital. Then, pain. Her whole body was in pain. In particular, the space between her legs felt as if she had been scorched with a white hot piece of iron. Then, sight again. Two silhouettes that appeared to be her parents floated vaguely at the periphery of her field of view. 
A figure that appeared to be a doctor came into view, asked a question. She replied. Suddenly, everything before her went dark. It was a deep, dreamless sleep. She wasn't aware how many times she repeated the cycle of waking in the clinical hospital ward and falling back into a dead sleep. Her memories only became a solid mass again after she returned to her parents' home. She was in that same old third floor room, surrounded by, by her familiar things. From outside the window, the expanse of fields stretched out into the distance as it had done before. Everything was so familiar, but nothing felt real almost as if she were separated from it by a vast emptiness. This was a similar looking, but completely different world. She had already realized that she would never be able to go back to the world she had once lived in. Her door opened and she heard someone come in. She flinched as her eyes snapped to the doorway. It was her mother. Of course it was, she knew that. Yet for some reason, the person standing at the door seemed like a complete stranger from a distant planet. Or, to be more accurate, it didn't seem like a person at all, rather a doll or mannequin or something that had simply taken on a human form. Were you already up? her mother asked. In her hands was a bowl of noodles. Right, it's lunchtime already, she thought, almost as if she were thinking of someone else's schedule. Yeah, she said with a quick nod. You must be hungry. Being me, I made your favourite, beef noodle soup. It's hot, so you don't have to rush eating it, okay? Her mother placed the bowl on her desk. Above the desk was a photo. That photo from fourth grade of her classmates sat around the school organ. Dan Chen, that was her name. Of course, I forgot that had happened, she thought, staring at the photograph. Don't dwell on this more than you have to, okay? Soon you'll be off to university and you'll be having fun all the time, her mother said. Staring at her silent daughter, her mother reached out her arms in an embrace. Immediately, she recoiled. Her mother dropped her arms with a sigh. Rest up once you've eaten. I'll come get the bowl later, she said before quietly leaving the room. She stared over at her lunch. Steam floated from the surface of the soup. She moved herself to her desk and picked up her chopsticks, but she wasn't hungry in the slightest. All of a sudden, her phone started buzzing. The name on the screen was Shasha's. Thank you, Arthur and Lee, for your reading. Uh, our next readers will be translator Kira Josephson and Arthur Hanna Johansson. Kira Josephson is a writer, editor, and translator working between English and Swedish. A Penheim Translation Fund grant winner, her work has appeared in Granta, Words Without Borders, The Nation, and elsewhere. Hanna Johansson is an author and critic who writes about art, literature, and queer themes. Antiken is her debut novel. Welcome, Kira and Hanna. Thank you so much, Piotr, and thank you um, to the committee for inviting us to be part of this really amazing uh, lineup. We're so happy to, hear, to be here. Um, thank you, everyone, also, who's uh, tuning in to listen. Um, so Hanna and I are going to be reading from her uh, prize-winning debut, Antiken. Um, antiquity uh, in English. It came out in Swedish last year and it really knocked me dead uh, when I first read it. Um, so it's, uh, it's such a pleasure and such an exciting thing to be able to um, share it with you all today. Um, Hanna is going to start off by uh, telling us a little bit about the novel um, and then we'll both read in Swedish and in English. Hanna. Thank you so much Kira for your kind words and thank you to the organizers for having us. Um, I will just very briefly introduce the main characters of this novel and, um, and then I will read a, a short bit in Swedish. So there are three women in the center of this novel, um, a nameless narrator who um, visits a friend, Helena, and um, on this trip encounters Helena's teenage daughter who becomes an object of uh, obsession and desire for her. So the narrator who doesn't have a name, Helena and Olga, those are the, the, main, uh, the main characters. Um, yeah, now I will read. Helena ville gå till torget för att se på världsmästerskapen. 
Ja, de har hållit på i tre dagar. Jag berättade för henne om vad vi hade sett när vi gick från bryggan på eftermiddagen. En scen, massvis med människor. Helena ville gå dit och vara bland människorna. Varför sa du ingenting tidigare? Nästan ilska i hennes röst. Skarp, hård, din lilla idiot. En ilska som jag njöt av, för det var intim ilska. Ilskan mellan medlemmar i en familj. Thank you. Helena wanted to go to the square to watch the World Championships. Yeah, they've been going on for three days. I told her what we'd seen when we left the dock that afternoon. A stage, big crowds. Helena wanted to go and be part of that crowd. Why didn't you say anything? A quality like anger in her voice. It was sharp, hard, you idiot. I savored this anger because it was an intimate anger, the type of anger expressed between members of a family. Now she wanted to have dinner at the square and I regretted having said anything. I was of two minds. Going with her would mean leaving Olga home alone. But Olga wanted to come. Yeah, I guess I can come. Her voice quiet, quiet timid, polite, cautious. Why not? Whatever. I saw how happy it made Helena. She was surprised and happy to hear it, borderline euphoric. Suddenly she was chomping at the bit to leave, as if we had to hurry before Olga changed her mind. For the first time since my arrival to the island, she put on perfume. We walked there, and when the sidewalk narrowed, I ended up behind them, too far back to catch more than fragments of their conversation, but close enough to smell the scent that trailed Helena. Their closeness made me sad, the way they constantly found their way back to their places, how they returned to each other. The curtains hung like ghosts in the windows of City Hall. The palm trees were illuminated by bright lights and the facade, I'd never seen the square in the dark before. Around the streetlights, the sky was low, dirty, cosmos was far away. There were no stars between the arches. The marble ground gleamed and the pigeons were there and the sounds from the stage. I was seated between Olga and Helena like a borderline or a hyphen. Helena focused on the images on the screen. She spoke in half sentences. She was distracted by the surroundings. She was commenting on the things we saw. She wanted grilled fish. It wasn't on the menu, but she was sure, 100% sure that she had smelled it from another table. She made a complex order. White wine in a carafe, soda for Olga, a bottle of Coca-Cola and a tall glass with lemon slices and ice. Olga shrank, became small at the table. Her posture was bad. Her shoulders came out, sloping. She drank from the straw without picking up the glass. The gray sea on the screen was illuminated. It turned blue. Helena's small movements, an unremitting tension in her shoulders, her jaw. She couldn't tear the gaze, her gaze from the distance, the luster over there, the men, their hats, the teenage boys. The pigeons took off from the square in a flapping cloud, their wings beating like a rain. The teens were chasing them with wild faces that straightened out when the birds lifted. It seemed like they understood that what they were doing was childish, a game they had outgrown, which should no longer give them joy. They were testing the boundaries of childhood or adulthood maybe, chasing pigeons ironically, self-consciously, without genuine excitement and desire. But nonetheless, they repeated their choreography again and again, their attack on the pigeons as soon as they landed. It was aggressive, it was just a game. Now and then I noticed how Olga seemed to seek my gaze, quiet but intent, as if she was waiting for a cue that never came. It silenced me, sitting between her and Helena. I felt I couldn't talk to Olga in front of Helena, and that feeling egged me on. We were hiding something together. I met Olga's gaze. I returned my attention to the square. I looked at the teenagers and the lives they held in front of them looked at this memory they would keep or lose, the flight of the pigeons, the palm trees, and the scent of frying oil, coconut, plastic, and sand that stuck to bodies and clothes. The last childhood games, the puny hair under arms and between legs, the sweat that had started to smell, sperm at night. It looked like they were hiding in their clothes, their thick sweaters like turtle shells, sleeves pulled down, collars popped, so half their faces were covered. 
Their legs were so thin and naked, their knees like foals, feet large, bodies out of tune. It didn't occur to me then that they might have been Olga's age. You can't know with boys. They might have been older. They seemed younger, much younger. They were their own species. They followed their own logic. Impossible for me to think of her as one of them. We ordered yet another carafe of wine, yet another soda in a glass bottle, more ice. We didn't move when the crowd thinned and the boys reunited with their fathers. And soon the restaurants too emptied, quieted. We walked up the stairs past the tourism agency and the ferry ticketing office, past the casino, the chapel, the store that sold musical instruments. Helena and Olga ahead of me and me just behind them, right there, silent. It all seemed so distant in the night. The sun was distant and the white roof, the head on the arm, my leg between the thighs, distant. Even though that same person was walking right in front of me. It was impossible. It couldn't be the same person, could not be the person who was presently walking arm in arm with her mother. When I flipped the light switch in the foyer, we were blinded. The light was white and glossy, almost green. The night seemed to have deepened Helena's wrinkles and her face was shiny. She brought her hands through her head and moved them through her hair like a prayer. She was dead tired. She gave Olga a hug. I'd never seen her do that before. I smelled the familiar mix of sweat and perfume. The embrace bothered me. It was a small foyer and I felt in the way, too close, too much a participant and too much an outsider, a jealous witness. I felt impatient on the brink of something big. I felt pregnant with it. I was anxious about the night, which would become day. I remained where I stood as Helena moved deeper inside the house. I watched her very tired gait her defeated steps. Olga and I brushed our teeth in front of the bathroom mirror. It was her who followed me once Helena had gone inside, lay down, crashed. I made space for her next to me at the sink. It was a familiar gesture I associated with my previous romantic relationships. A life lived side by side. The space you make for the other and the space they make for you when you reach for something. Pass each other, spit past each other. It was an unfamiliar gesture because it was her and I had never been so close to her in the night. I watched her in the mirror and her reflection gazed back. The black eyes, the woolly eyebrows, the mouth full of foam. She brushed hard, so I brushed harder until the toothbrush hit my soft insides, jaws tense and rigid. I was fatigued. I felt desire make its return from the day, more palpable now, purer, stronger and more dangerous, no longer dismissible. It was no longer possible to conceive of not acting on it. I saw a possibility, but I had to be cautious. I sensed the ecstatic feeling of anticipation, the certainty and hesitation of my movements. I sensed my towing the line close to the underworld. I reined in my movements, made them smaller, slower, Olga spat, a string of blood in the foam. I spat. The light in the bathroom whirred and quivered and made it look like she was trembling as she turned the faucet and everything drained in a gurgling spiral. We merged in the mirror. When I looked at her, it was as if I saw myself. When I kissed her, I liberated her from something, her childhood, her mother. Thank you. Thank you. Kira and Hannah for your terrific reading. Our next pair of readers will be translator Adriana X. Jacobs and author Von Nguyen. Adriana X. Jacobs is a poet, scholar, and translator of modern Hebrew poetry. Her translations have appeared in Gulf Coast, World Literature Today, and North American Review, among other venues. Her translation of Von Nguyen's The Truffle Eye, published this year by Zephyr Press, was supported by a 2015 Penheim Translation Fund Grant. Van Wen is the author of the poetry collection, the aforementioned The Truffle Eye, as well as Bain Racial, published by Bahash in 2018. In addition to poetry, she has worked as an actress, journalist, and social activist. She currently lives in Jaffa, Israel, and is writing her first novel. Welcome, Adriana and Van. 
Well, first of all, um, as others have said, I want to thank the organizers uh, for including me and Bon in this uh, really wonderful event, to have this chance to hang out with all of you, even if it's virtually. Um, so I came across Von Nguyen's poetry in 2009, which was shortly after uh, the chapbook version of this book um, in Hebrew, Eina Kmihin, in English, The Truffle Eye was published. And I was completely dazzled by her poetry and started translating bits of it. Um, in 2013, the book version came out. Um, and that's when I started to think about maybe doing the whole book. And as Piotr mentioned, a 2015 uh, Penheim translation grant was actually very instrumental in encouraging me and Van that this uh, would be possible. Um, so the book, as you can see, came out um, early this year. So it's a pandemic publication. It came out with Zephyr Press. Um, and uh, we're just very excited to share it with you. Um, because we both, I think, would love to travel um, and can't do so at the moment. Um, I, Vaughn and I selected poems um, that all evoke travel in some way, which is one of the major themes of the book. There are a lot of, there's a lot of moving around in this collection. Some of these movements are forced onto people um, and they can also be elective movements and even imaginary movements. Uh, so Vaughn will start off uh, reading in Hebrew and we'll go back and forth reading from the Truffle Eye. So this poem called uh, the Mekong River, Nahar Mekong. Halayla chalafte le shalosh mitot, kmo shati ba Mekong ve lachashd et yefi aprat ve achidekel. Mitachad le rega etamid mechapeset, mitachad etit esmali esh lichor, ve eta memale oto be gvarim acherim. Reach shel bira tiger al gufcha. Bebdidut, yesh rash tzartzarim midorom le laos, mamterot shel avir kar mehanoi. Agav mitnashef pa yashvan mehudak, ketem dio ala beten. צייר לי תרשים זרימה בצבע אחיד על פרחים טריים באגרטל. אשפיך למרגלותיך השורשים, רוצה לגמור להקי גרגרי אבק בערוותי. הנחת אתך בתוך תחתוני. תהיה אישי. מי מעז לעזוב מחלה באמצע ים? Under an endless moment, looking below the left tit, I have a hole and you fill it with other men, notes of tiger beer on your body. Alone, crickets drone south of Laos, showers of cold air from Hanoi, the back gasps, the tight ass, an ink stain on the belly. Sketch me a monochrome flowchart on fresh potted flowers. I'll release roots at your feet. I want to come to puke specks of dust in my crotch. Rest your hand in my pants. Make it personal. Who dares abandon a disease mid-sea? This one calls Pirkei Metropolin. Azov at the binyanim agvoyim me'alainu, otanu sheyoshvim al mikhseh biyuv, ma'achorei ashurutim shel arachov. Azov at kol atrufot ve'amatefet alevana shenoelet otcha b'tzad ha'medukayim. צלילים של סלוטייפ לבן. אתה תזכור לי דירה עם חדר כתיבה בעיר, אכריח אותך לכתוב כל יום שיר עליי. אתה תכתוב שיר עליי כמו שאמרת שאת אוהבת את הייאוש. אמרת שזה מקסים. This is Metropolitan Pieces, and I'm reading from Brooklyn, and I've always read this as a New York poem, but I'll let you decide. Metropolitan Pieces. Leave the buildings towering over us, squatting on a manhole cover. behind the public toilets. Leave the meds and the white coat that locks you in with these depressives, spools of white scotch tape. You, find me a place in this city with a room to write. I'll make you write a poem about me every day. You'll write a poem about me, like you said. What you love about me is the desperation. It's brilliant, you said. Thanks. שלוש תמונות מפריז. על ספסל צרפתי בגינה, אימא צועקת על ילד חורג. הוא טובל את היד במזרקה. מישהו מעשן ג'וינט. מקיף את עיניו להסתירן מבין העננים קרן אוגוסט קוביסטית. אוגוסט על תאלת שאנזליזה, דופק ברחם, 
הקצי סיגריות על קבצן ישן מתחת ירח הגול על מסגרת קרטון. שוב אתה נצמד אליי מול טיפות ורעש, יללה מול בתים גרמניים. יש סליות על ספסלים ואתה נוטף דמעות אריות, נושך אותי בקנאת סופר, נושך בגב חזק עם השיניים פורס ועלבון מחוץ למרפסות הבוהמיות. הנה הגוף שלנו, מרצפות מדרכות של כבישים. הנה עיניי בעורפי. תראה יקירי איך אנחנו עתיקים כמו פריז, איך עוד תחלום עליי שוב בעצב. גשם אפוי בסירוב גרן מרניה, מריחים בצו אל השלשת יונים. איפה עליית הגג, איפה התקרה המחודדת, בשעה של פריז על גדות הסיין. On a French park bench, a mother screams as the stepchild dips his hand into the fountain. Someone smoking a joint, he shields his eyes between the clouds, a cubist August beam. Two, August on the promenade of the Champs-Elysees knocks on the womb. I threw up cigarettes on a beggar sleeping under a full moon on a cardboard frame. Again, you, cling to me with the drizzle and loud howling in front of German houses. Shadows rest on these benches and you weep lion tears and bite me with literary envy, bite down hard on my back with peak and teeth chomping on the bohemian balconies. Behold, our body is this tiled street pavement. Behold, I have eyes on my back. Look, darling, we are as old as Paris and still you'll dream about me with regret. Three, rain baked with Grand Marnier gives off notes of onion and pigeon shit. Where is the attic? Where is the vaulted ceiling in Paris time on the banks of the Seine? Hollywood. שום דבר לא מגיע אל תוך חדר מלחמה טעון כוכבים. עצי מניפה מטילים פירות מעל מכוניות נוסעות לרוחב הטיילת. מקורזלים עדיין עומדים על רגל אחת, מנגנים פסיכודליה מתוך אוהל. ראה אותי אני שגרה, בבית קפה על מייל רוז, בוהה בכלבים הנמלטים מבעליהם, עד שהשמש שבה לעיר על, עוד, על הוליווד מערב. במורד פסדינה הישנה, אנשים משוטטים עם מצלמה, מוצרד ברדיו. הם מדברים על ערפל יורד מעל הוליווד, מסתיר את השלט. הוליווד Nothing gets into a war room loaded with stars. Palm trees dropping fruit on the cars along the boardwalk, frizzy-haired yogis still standing on one leg, playing psychedelic songs inside a tent. Look at me, I'm a routine. In a cafe on Melrose, I'm staring at dogs running from their owners until the sun comes back to brighten West Hollywood. In downtown old Pasadena, people wander about with a camera, Mozart on the radio, they talk about the fog falling over Hollywood, hiding the sign. כביש מספר אחד. בכביש מספר אחת, אמריקה ניצבת על כת. פסגת ההר מוריקה יד ושם. אוספת תולעים לתפור עבורך שושלת ומסורת. היכן שאני משוטטת ברחובות, מחכה לאבסורד. בדרך אצמח, בדרך אקמול, זר זרדים מעל הראש. Highway 1. On Highway 1, America's fixed on a gun, the hilltop greening a place and a name, gathering worms to stitch an ancestry for you and a tradition. On the streets where I wander, I'm waiting for the absurd. On the way, I'll grow. On the way, I'll wither. Twigs crowning my head. בפירנאים. ישבנו בתוך בריכה מקורה בפירנאים, בוהים בשני צעדים גוררים חזירי בר במורדות השלכת. הכרת אותי בלי מפה, על עקבים עם שיער מסורק. עם ההוא שגרתי אצלו והרעיב. אני תמיד גרה עם מישהו רעבה. בערב בשוג למרגלות מנזר, מוכר הצביע על מרכולתו. בובה מונחת מתחת למכונית צעצוע. בנג בנג, קרע האוכל. מחר הגיש לי חלב פנתרות, בסירנה עברה. חשבתי על חדר המדרגות של תל אביב, חיכיתי לפיצוץ הפז'אר. 
זה קורה עכשיו, אני בן אדם אחר מאז שר המלחמה שעבר. Last poem, in the Pyrenees. We sat in an indoor pool in the Pyrenees, staring at two hunters dragging wild boars down autumn slopes. You met me without a map, with my high heels and combed hair, living with that guy who starved. I am always living with someone and hungry. In the evening at the market at the foot of a monastery, a seller pointed at his wares, a doll lying under a toy car. Bang, bang, the peddler cried out, then offered me panther milk. And a siren passed by. I thought about that stairwell in Tel Aviv, waiting for the shock of the Fajr. It's happening now. Since the last minister of war, I am someone else. Thank you, Adriana and Vaughn. Um, as an LA resident, I appreciate uh, hearing all those LA references. Uh, thank you. Uh, our final pair of readers will be translator Julia Grammeyer and author Marie-Christine Bernat. Julia Grammeyer's translations have appeared with Schaffner Press, Kenyon Review, and FSG. She teaches the Kenyon Review Young Writers Workshop and also French and intercultural communication to middle schoolers. She received a translation grant from the CNL for her upcoming translation of Estelle Sarah Buell's novel, Where Dogs Bark With Their Tails. Marie-Christine Bernard was born in Carleton sur mer and lives in Quebec. She teaches literature, creative writing, film analysis, and ethnology. She collaborated over several years with the Nerowi Zoo community to listen to their stories and create her novel, Matistewin. Welcome, Julia and Marie-Christine. Thank you so much, Piotr, and the organizers at PEN America. We're very pleased to be here. I'll give a, a brief overview of the book, and then I'll have Marie-Christine read first. Um, this book, Matisse Win, um, is here, um, and it's the story of a woman who I imagine is about, about my age, Sarah Migonish. Um, she's a part of a community in, Quebecois, in Quebec of um, First Nations people. Um, we'll hear more about which, which group in particular. Um, so she's taking on a big journey. Um, she's wearing snowshoes. She's going along the chemin. This is the path that her ancestors trod. It's a very traditional path. She's guided in this story by the voice of her deceased grandmother. Uh, she sets off to find what she thought had been lost forever. So this book covers a lot of different themes that we hear um, about First Nations communities. In recent news events, we've heard certainly about the boarding schools. This book touches on that as well. Um, as well as some of the other um, very serious challenges for this community. Um, so I will have Marie-Christine start. Um, this first section, the book is divided as a glossary is with several different tiny chapters, each word or phrase um, in the language kind of presented and then explained by the grandmother. So she's going to begin with a section called time. Hi, everybody. I'm very pleased to be there with you. Um, OK. Le temps des Blancs, c'est comme si l'infini avait été cassé en petites perles toutes égales qu'ils enfilent sur un collier qui ne sera jamais refermé, qui ne parera jamais aucun coup. À quoi sert un collier qui va toujours tout droit? Je veux bien enfiler des perles, et que ces perles soient des morceaux de temps. Mais chaque perle a sa couleur et son poids et ne ressemble à aucune autre. Chaque heure est habitée d'elle-même et nous dicte ce dont elle doit être faite. On n'a plus le choix, bien sûr. Il nous faut maintenant faire de nos vies ce collier qui va tout droit, réduire l'infini des pe pardon. Réduire l'infini à des perles de plastique enfilées sur du nylon. Mais tu peux tresser ton propre temps, nos cimes. Il y a des moments où tu peux te blottir dans le temps des Indiens, celui qui ne se révèle qu'à lui-même dans la vérité de ce qui est, celui qui sait que du lendemain, on ne peut rien savoir et que du passé, on peut tout apprendre. Regarde-toi marcher. Ta journée se tresse pas à pas, un mocassin devant l'autre, 
Le soleil t'a dit quand partir, il te dira quand t'arrêter. Piréou, la perdrie, s'est présentée hier au chasseur. Elle a donc décidé que tu as ce que tu allais manger. Le soir appelle les contes et le thé chaud dans les odeurs du sapinage, puis les paupières lourdes et les joues brûlantes d'avoir passé le jour à se faire griffer par le froid. Demain, ta marche reprendra. Le jour aura d'autres couleurs. Tes pas, peut-être, te ramèneront un peu plus près de ce que tu es. Il n'y a pas de mot dans notre langue pour nommer le temps. Il y a le jour et la nuit, les fruits, la neige, la chasse, l'amour, les enfants, la mort. Tout cela se tricote au maille de ce qui passe et qui revient, et de tout ce qui recommence. C'est le temps des Nero Donc, ils ont dit que le voyage durerait deux semaines, à peu près. C'est dans le calendrier des Blancs la mesure d'une durée qu'ils croient finie. Mais tu comprends, en mettant l'une devant l'autre tes raquettes, que le temps ne se mesure pas. Le temps s'inscrit dans l'espace. Quand j'avais l'âge de ta fille et que nous montions dans les territoires, nous ne disions pas « nous y serons dans deux, trois ou quatre semaines ». Nous disions « nous y serons quand nous aurons remonté jusqu'à la tête de la rivière, effectué tous les portages, relevé assez de pièges. Le temps se comptait en lieux visités et en tâches complétées. Quel besoin de compter les heures, dégrener de petits morceaux de temps, comme autant des cales de cocotte, dis-moi. Les travaux à faire perdurent tant qu'ils ne sont pas terminés et n'existent plus une fois accomplis. La clarté nous indique quand c'est le jour et la noirceur nous dit quand c'est la nuit. Nous savons si le soir vient par le son des chants d'oiseaux, par le sentier du vent qui vire, par l'odeur de la terre qui change. Nous savons les changements de saison par le voyage des oies et la couleur des feuilles, par ce qui pousse et par ce qui ne pousse plus. Ne compte pas les heures. Pose tes raquettes l'une devant l'autre. Avance. Avance. Vous arriverez quand vous arriverez. Tu arriveras où tu arriveras. C'est ainsi que nous traversions le territoire autrefois. Non pas dans la neige marquait une durée qui s'imprimait dans l'espace, une durée qui formait un cercle au bout du compte, puisque chaque cycle se terminait au point où il avait commencé. Puisque chaque fois, le chemin nous ramenait au printemps suivant d'où nous étions partis. Marche. Ton corps te dit quoi faire. Tes pieds parlent avec la terre. Ne demande pas quelle heure il est, quel jour. Marche dans le temps des sauvages. Sarah Migounich, ma petite fille, c'est là que se trouve ton âme. So, in the section, we're going to follow Sarah Migounich. Um, who is from the Ne Irui Siu people in Quebec. And with Marie Christine, we are currently in the process of finding a publisher for this wonderful book. This section is called What Time Is It? With white people time, it is as though infinity has been broken into tiny pearls, each the same size, that are strung onto a necklace that will never be buckled closed, that will never sit upon anyone's neck. What good is a necklace that continues on in a straight line? Sure, stringing pearls is fine, and the pearls can be moments in time, but each pearl has its own color and weight and looks like no other pearl. Each hour is inhabited by itself alone and tells us what it is meant for. But we no longer have the choice, of course. Now we must turn our lives into this necklace that continues straight on, reducing what is infinite down to plastic pearls strung onto nylon. But you can weave your own time, Nusim. There are moments when you can nestle yourself inside of Indian time. Time that only reveals itself to itself, reveals itself in the truth of what is. Time that knows that we can't know anything about tomorrow and that we can learn everything from the past. Observe yourself as you walk. Your day is braided step by step, one moccasin in front of the other. The sun told you when to leave, it will tell you when to stop. Piriu, the partridge, revealed herself yesterday to the hunter, and so she was the one who decided that you were going to eat. 
The evening calls forth stories and hot tea in the aroma of fir branches and brings on heavy eyelids and burning cheeks from having spent the day being clawed at by the cold. Tomorrow, your walk will begin again. The day will take on other colors and your steps might bring you back a little closer to what you are. There's no word to, de to designate time in our language. There's the day and the night, fruit, snow, hunting, love, children, death. All of this is knitted upon the needles of what passes and comes back and of everything that begins again. This is Neiro ne with you time. So they said that the trip would take two weeks, about that long. That is, on the white people's calendar, a stretch of time they deem complete. But you understand as you put one snowshoe in front of the other that time cannot be measured. Time is a part of space. When I was your daughter's age and we would walk our ancestral land, we wouldn't say, we will be there in two, three or four weeks. We would say, we will be there when we have climbed to the head of the river, when the portages have been completed, when we have collected enough traps. Time was measured in places visited and tasks finished. Tell me, why would we need to count the hours, chip off little pieces of time like eggshells? The work to be done lasts until it is finished. And once it is accomplished, it no longer exists. The daylight tells us when the day has come and the darkness tells us when it is night. We know the night is coming by the songs the birds sing, by feeling the wind shifting, by smelling the earth changing. We know the changing of the seasons by the flight of the geese and the color of the leaves, by what is growing and what no longer grows. Do not count the hours. Set your snowshoes on the ground, one in front of the other. Keep going, keep going. You will get there when you get there. You will end up where you end up. This is how we used to move across the land before. Our steps in the snow marked a duration that was imprinted onto space, a duration that created a circle in the end since each cycle would finish at the place where it had started. Since each time the path brought us back the following spring to where we had originally begun. Walk, your body will tell you what to do. Your feet are talking with the earth. Don't ask what time it is or what day. Walk in Indian time, Sara Migunish my granddaughter. That is where your spirit is. Thank you so much, Julia, Marie, Christine. Uh, fingers crossed for the book finding a publisher right after this reading. Uh, and what a treat to hear all these voices from around the world. A huge thank you to all of our readers. We can clap now, I think. Um, okay, it looks like we have time for questions. Um, anyone from the audience, uh, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the chat or send it to the Q&A box. Um, maybe before we get a, the first question from the audience, I would like to ask a question. Um, could some of you speak um, a little about the joys and challenges of collaboration um, in translating these, uh, these poems, these novels, etc.? I suppose I can begin. I think something that all of us probably resonate with um, is the challenge of COVID and not being able to meet maybe as planned with our authors. Um, gotten familiar with Google Docs and WhatsApp and voice messages as ways to try to approximate those connections. Um, but I think that's one of the challenges for me is just canceling plans to meet with authors, et cetera. Well, that's challenging for sure. Anybody else? Let me take a look here. Looks like we have a question from the audience. Um, how did each, each of the translators find their authors? Well, that's a great question. I can speak to that a little bit. Yes. Oh, Adriana, did you want to go first? No, you go and then I can go. Okay, great. Um, so Natalia's uh, book is published by um, the same publisher as another uh, 
poet that I've translated, um, this publishing company just is doing a really great job of sort of finding these new voices. So it was just by sort of being familiar with their um, with their reading list. And then uh, our relationship began in a very millennial way. We um, corresponded by Facebook Messenger um, for a long time. Um, uh, when I asked Natalia if I could translate this book of poems. So this is the first time that we actually got to read together and it was uh, really special. So yeah, thanks again. And in my case, um, I found Van's poetry online. So uh, usually Israeli newspapers are still a really great source for contemporary poetry. Um, and I think I was just sort of browsing around and and then came across her poems in um, just online. And um, and it just by luck, the chapbook had come out and it was available as a downloadable PDF. Um, so that was really handy because it's not always easy to get books. It's gotten easier to get books from Israel, but um, in 2009, it was still a little tricky, um, especially contemporary literature. You'd have to, in my case, I would have to actually be there to sometimes get those sort of uh, works. Um, so that was really lucky. And then we were mostly in touch virtually until we finally had a chance to meet in person in, in the before pandemic days. Um, I guess I can go if we're doing this popcorn style. Um, Hannah and I actually met before her book was even out. Um, I am friends with her girlfriend from before. I think Sana is on this, uh, is a attendee here as well. Hey Sana. Um, and so we had met before and I was really curious about um, the novel because I really appreciated Hannah's aesthetics. Um, but it's not always that, you know, you know friends and they write something and it's not always as amazing as this book was. So um, after that, um, after I had read it, um, I wrote and asked if, if uh, there were already thoughts about it being translated um, and felt very lucky um, to learn that nobody had jumped on it yet. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience. I quote, uh, how much freedom do you have in making changes to the original writing? Do you see your relationship as an equal collaboration? Well, that's a good question. The whole argument of fidelity and creativity, right? Would anybody like to speak to that? Um, yeah, I can. I, I might as well put myself out there. <laughs> um, with uh, solo dance that uh, I'm translating for Likotomi, there are. It's very much based within the kind of giant Japanese and Chinese literary canons. There's a lot of references that a Japanese reader or a Chinese reader would just know without the author being specified. So I asked uh, Lee if I could not to explain all these references, but to like give a bit of a footstep into what they mean and their kind of purpose in the text. And I think um, a lot of authors might wouldn't want changes like that. They wouldn't want to explicate things. So I think that was a really nice um, kind of part of the process to be able to just give the uh, an English speaking reader that little bit of extra information that they might need to see the importance of these references, I think. Great. Anybody else? Okay. I guess I, I guess I see, um, I guess I see uh, my translation as one big change. Every, everything is changed. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of difficult question. Um, everything is a change from the original writing. So I think about that a bit differently. Um, Natalia and I um, have the kind of relationship where. Uh, she, I often ask her questions and she will send a response that's very much in the vein of her writing itself. She will sort of describe a scene or tell me a memory or um, these sort of ways of answering my question that, that are not actually give, you know, giving me the word she wants me to use, um, but instead giving me the world of the, of the poem and, um, and, then I, and then I create it. So I'm yeah, grateful for that way of working together. Okay, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, looks like we have time for one more question. Um, 
And I would like to ask this, the following question. So uh, presumably quite a few translators are in the audience here with us today. And could some of you speak to the process of finding a publisher for your work? Those of you who, who found a publisher and published the work from which you read, uh, and those of you who are still looking for a publisher, could you also say something about the trials and tribulations of finding a, a publisher here in the States or perhaps in the UK? Julia, go ahead. I think one of the things that I've observed is um, having the ear maybe of certain publishers and then um, hearing feedback about um, what, what they have room for in their line. Um, a metaphor that was explained to me um, was kind of like the idea of a, of a life, a life raft. And they had to save certain spaces for books that they know would serve a certain purpose. Um, you know, in their in their editorial, maybe like financial financial books, um, and they would reserve some spaces um, for other smaller projects. And so I think there's that constant tension um, that I'm up against um, sometimes with these projects. Thank you. Maybe I'll add if we have time. Yes, we do. Please. Yeah. Um, that there's been some discussion around this. Uh, I guess there's always some <laughs> discussion around this in the translation community, but um, it's. It differs quite a lot depending on which language you translate from. There are languages that do get a lot of support. For example, Swedish uh, tends to, the Swedish Arts Council is very generous with grants and so forth. There are a lot of agents um, who, who look for publishers. Other languages, um, for example, Turkish translator Nicholas Glastonbury wrote this um, essay about the difficulty of finding um, publishers for a minor language as, as it is known in certain circles. Of course, it's not minor uh, <laughs> literarily, for example, um, and how, how hard that is if you work from a language where there isn't, um, you don't have access to that support because then you have to do all of that work for free, as it were. Um, of course, sometimes, you know, we also do this because we, we love doing what we do, but um, it's easier to take on a project that you adore um, if you do have uh, the ability to get income from, from other sources as well. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of tricky landscape, um, I think, uh, globally speaking, um, and that where it varies a lot um, depending on which language you, you translate from. Um, but also true that having personal connections is, is helpful. Okay, great, thank you. Anybody else? Um, you know, this topic is, is just really, really fascinating to me. And uh, I wanna maybe do a little a plug here. Those of you who are coming to the Alta Conference in Tucson, one of the round tables will cover this topic. We'll talk about the challenges of introducing uh, new voices into the American uh, literary marketplace. Uh, okay, you guys, uh, this was great. Thanks again to the Penn Translation Committee to my co-organizers, Nancy Naomi Carlson, Jenna Tang, and Sharon Dolan, to Larissa Kaiser, to Rachel Roseman, and to our hosts, Pan America and the Pen Translation Committee. And thank you, members of the audience, for joining us today. Thank you, guys. It was great.